Hey Flock, Mike here from Epic Duck Studios and welcome to the Epic Hobby. Today I'm going to be painting the Harbinger Comet from Privateer Press's Monster Apocalypse. You can see I just jumped right into airbrushing this. I am using Reaper Master Series HD Brilliant Red. Now that paint is currently out of production. If I were to start again, I would be using probably P3 Kador Red Base or possibly Mephiston Red from Citadel. So I'm starting by just getting the brilliant red everywhere, making sure every single crease and crevice is covered. Just getting them basically a nice even coat of this color red into, you know, all the deep parts, all the different areas of the model, just working it everywhere. Next up, I'm going a little bit lighter and using some Citadel Wild Rider red. And I'm starting this from the top of the comet and kind of working my way down. You can see I'm kind of holding the comet at about a 45 degree angle to the airbrush so that I've got that deeper red towards the bottom and in the deeper areas. Now I'm switching over to Reaper Highlight Orange and I'm dry brushing this on rather than airbrushing it so that it focuses more towards the edges of the crystals. Basically with this really large crystal structure, I'm just building up the colors as rapidly as I can using simple broad techniques, which is basically airbrushing and dry brushing. Those are the two simplest ones. So now I'm coming in with some more colors, one coat yellow, and this is just a very highly opaque yellow. Any other yellow would work just as well if I wanted to use Flash Gets Yellow or maybe P3 Cygnus Yellow. They just might take more than one coat to really get to the same point. So you can see the orange is really kind of focused on these outer parts of the crystal now, and we're seeing the deeper colors left behind, and that's what dry brushing gives us. Now I'm switching over to a little bit of white using P3 Mora White and focusing this really on the outcroppings of each crystal. I've also really unloaded the brush here, and what I do for that is I unload it on a piece of cardboard. Cardboard is incredibly desiccant and pulls all the fluid out of the paint. So you're left with basically just a bunch of powdery pigment on the brush, and it makes it just that much easier to dry brush than blotting your brush off on paper towel does. With the white, I'm also doing a second coat here. I'm going back in just over all the same areas because I just really want to pull those edges out, make them very, very sharp and defined. All right, so all of the bulk work is done, all the airbrushing and dry brushing, and now we're gonna get into detailing pieces of this. I'm gonna begin the detailing process with Mechanicus Standard Gray, and I'm gonna be using this as a base coat for all those little pods attached to the Comet. Now, there are quite a few of these little pods, and it's a very repetitive process because they're all going to get the exact same base coat. So I'm just going to show you one or two here, and you can let your imagination fill in the rest. With those dark gray base coats down, I'm going to pull out a lighter gray, in this case Citadel Administratum Gray. I'm going to be using this now to start to etch in a sort of non-metallic metal finish. This is going to be very, very similar to the work I did on Gorgodra because of course they're the same faction. So if you've seen my Gorgodra Metallics video, you're going to be really familiar with this look. If not, what I'm going for is kind of a sort of a comic book inspired brushed steel is probably the easiest way for me to describe it. There's a lot of sort of linear details traveling in the direction of each of these little planes and along their curve as well. And the idea is that there's sort of, you know, grooves kind of worked into the surface that cause the light to refract in different ways. And so we get these sort of interplays of highlight and shadow that don't necessarily come from anywhere. And these little sort of embedded pods are really where I'm bringing comic style to this piece. Otherwise, the crystal itself is pretty straightforward. It's a series of, you know, airbrushing, dry brushing, and a little bit of edge work coming up a little bit later in the video. But these little pods are where I tie this whole piece back to my other Planet Eater pieces, which have all painted very much in comic style. You know, everything's really based on comic book artwork in that series of models. And I didn't really want to sit there and draw little black lines all over the crystals. I felt like it was not time well spent and also there's a hundred million of them I'd have to do and it just would probably kill my sanity. So I decided instead just to really focus on 
bringing my comic style kind of vision to these little embedded pieces and letting the crystal just be crystal. That also helps give the crystal the illusion of glowing because it doesn't have the weight and the darkness of the black lines. So the crystal kind of almost begins to feel like a light source as well. So you notice as I'm adding this light gray area, it always tapers to the top of each of these panels. You know, it's very lightest up at the top. And this sort of series of, you know, parallel gray arcs I'm doing across the surface all become wider and kind of coalesce at the top of each plane. Now I'm going to basically repeat that same process with uh, P3 Mora White. Any bright white will do here. This is where we want to just add our final highlight to the metallics. What you'll see here though is where there's a bit of a crest here where those two sort of angles meet together. I'm picking one side and dropping the bright color, the white, on the one side. And it's immediately counterpointed by the darkest gray on the opposite side. And by counterplaying your darkest color to your lightest color, it makes the brights feel brighter and the darks feel darker, and you get more visible contrast by having those two colors sitting side by side. And what that does is it makes the edge actually feel sharper. Now each of the little pods has a small gem in the middle. I'm going to be using Citadel Xeris Purple to base coat those gems. This again is a really repetitive, straightforward process. So I'm going to skip ahead after one or two of these and get on to highlighting them. So for the highlight here, I wanted to go with a really vibrant magenta. My favorite here is Vallejo Game Color Warlord Purple. Murderous Magenta from P3 or Screamer Pink from Citadel also work pretty well in this case. Now I want these to have a little bit of a gem-like appearance, so what I'm doing with this highlight is really keeping it kind of in a letter C sort of shape, cresting across the top of each of these little orbs, and leaving more of the dark purple visible at the bottom. And what it's going to do is kind of give the idea of some internal refracted light. Now this magenta tends to be on the thinner side, and that means it takes either multiple coats to build up a good coverage, or you basically get a little bit of edge blending for free because it just kind of feathers out as the brush applies it. With those magenta arcs down, I'm going to go back to the Mora White, which I've already got on the palette, and just add a few small shiny spots to the top of each of the gems. Now there's some rubble around the edge of the base. What I'm doing here is I'm taking just a little bit of Thamar Black and mixing that into the Mechanicus Gray I've already got on the palette from base coating the little pods just to get a little bit of a darker gray. That way the sort of broken concrete around the base takes on a little bit more of like a road asphalt feel 
and also doesn't tie the color back to the little pods. I honestly want, you know, the parts of Earth and the alien parts to feel distinct. The trick here, of course, is making sure that I get all the little bits of rubble without accidentally messing up any of the crystals. So it does make this a little bit more time consuming than it otherwise would be. Simply because there's a lot of small kind of crevices where, you know, two different pieces of rubble overlap. And I need to make sure I work paint into them without, you know, messing up all the different oranges and reds I've already worked with. Now there's a set of grills on the top of each one of these pods, and I've chosen to use some Citadel Contrast Blood Angels Red to really just kind of bring out that detail by settling deep red into, you know, the crevices of each grill, and then just tinting the surfaces, and that'll kind of bring the color, you know, into the same theme as the rest of the comet itself. Now I don't 100% know what these details are supposed to be. In my head, these little rocket pod things that are bolted onto this comet are some sort of engine meant to accelerate and steer it. That's how I see this anyway. It's kind of a way of getting the comet where they want it to go. And so I thought having sort of a red, you know, warm engine glow to them made sense to me. And that's where I'm going with these. Now, while I was working on those red grills, I decided that the red actually looked really good on the crystal itself. It really lent to some extra sort of depth to the color. And so what I'm doing is I'm applying really thin layers of it. First, I started just behind each of the pods, kind of casting not so much a shadow, but just the idea of some extra depth, maybe a shadow cast into the crystal itself. You know, I mean, the crystalline structure should be big and translucent, and of course, we have to paint it to that effect. And so first, I started by just working this, you know, swath of red in behind each of these little clusters, these little pods. And the more I looked at the red, the more I really just liked what it did to the colors I've already built up. So you can see now I switched to actually working it into the crevices really lightly between the different segments of the gem as well, the sort of different parts of the comet shard. So in effect, this ends up kind of taking the place of my normal comic book lining because I do work it in between all the different really big, you know, linear details of the comet itself. But not to the same level I would with black ink. I'm not working it into every single line. You can see I kind of use it to fade across some surfaces and, you know, kind of bring more of a gradient to an entire plane, stuff like that. So I'm using it to some effect to build depth, especially depth of color here, you know, bringing everything down to a much deeper red in some places. But not in the same way I would you know, bring black ink all over the place. And the reason for that is I want the whole comet to feel like it's glowing, like it's pulsing with the sort of internal energy. And if I did end up bringing in, you know, large areas of black ink, whether it's through shadows or through line work, it starts to make the whole thing feel more room temperature in a way, right? The black lines make things feel normal and we want this to be glowing and pulsing with energy and so by removing the black lines almost sort of replacing with red lines instead we create the idea of internal light and translucency so now i'm just using wide areas of the blood angels red and working it in behind these sort of outcroppings of the crystal to create you know, some shadows that kind of silhouette the crystal against itself. And this is pretty similar to the way I create large fill shadows using black ink on a character to kind of accentuate their stance and make them feel more dynamic in their movement. You know, what it lets you do is it lets the outcroppings of the crystal appear more vibrant than the core of the crystal when they're kind of viewed opposing each other. But all I'm really doing is feathering on really thin coats of Blood Angels Red. And it's worth noting, I've not thinned it down at all. I'm using the Blood Angels Red straight from the pot, and I'm using a damp brush. There's a little bit of water in the brush here, but I'm just applying it and really just using my brush to thin it out on the model, spread it around a little bit, and kind of, you know, pull it into a sort of gradient shape, right? I'm applying it where I want it darkest and then feathering it away across the surface to create a little bit of a transition. 
And this is really one of the hidden powers of contrast paint that's not discussed that often. You know, they're really good for just throwing down solid base coats over a light primer, but they also work amazingly well as tints. You know, a small amount of a contrast paint lightly loaded onto a damp brush can really be used to just push colors around. And I really actually enjoy using especially the blues and the reds to just make shadows deeper on different colors. It's really effective and really easy to do. So the next thing I want to do with this crystal here, I've added some deeper shadows. Now I want to add some brighter highlights. So for that, I'm just taking a little bit of straight white paint and I'm more or less just adding little drops of it to the cardinal points of each of these planes of the crystal. Since so there's a big, you know, flat facet of the crystal there, and I'm just sort of picking out all the corners, adding a little hit of light to them. Now I'm also adding some just little diagonal reflections to the surfaces of the crystal. Again, I'm just using the white paint and it's a little bit thinned down just by virtue of having a damp brush. And this really just takes the shape of some, you know, diagonal lines kind of running in parallel to each other, roughly 45 degrees to the surface of the crystal. And the idea here is that these are sort of like internal refractions happening. So we're either seeing light scattered from, you know, the backside of the crystal or maybe some internal structures, like maybe there's a little bit of a cleaving line in the crystal, things like that. It really just breaks up the biggest, most open surfaces of the crystal with just some extra little bit of freehand detail. It's really quick and easy to add. And you just basically keep them all going the same direction, just keep rotating around the crystal. So now comes the part where I really tie this back to the comic style approach that I used on all of my other Planet Eaters miniatures. And the star of this show is just going to be these little, you know, armor pods that are attached to the big crystal itself. And I'm really just working, you know, lines in to, there's a couple different grooves in the surface of each of the pods. You know, I want to line around that purple gem, and then I just want to work a little bit of a shadow into the different parts of these pods as well. So for the most part, it's two straight lines and a curve on each of these pods plus a little add-on detailing. So you can see here, I'm going around the gem. I've already laid in, you know, the straight line between the sort of left plane and right plane. And then I'm bringing one right along the center, just sitting beside that really bright line I struck earlier. With that done, I'm also going to use a little bit of black just to increase the contrast in the different sort of, you know, the striations, the sort of linear, you know, variations in light tone across the surface of these little arbor plates. And I'm really focusing that mostly towards the bottom of each of these little pods, but also kind of to accentuate that sort of intersection there, that little sort of, you know, part where the two creases meet. I'm throwing some black to the left hand side of it because there's a large area of white on the right hand side and it just really offsets each other. Now in this case where it's also really easy to reach, I'm adding a bit of a black line between the bottom of the pod and the crystal structure itself. And then again, a little bit along the inside edge of the top of the pod between it and those little grills that I washed Blood Angels red earlier. So here I'm just working a little bit of the black into the darkest part of the surface of the pod, just basically creating a little bit more of a reflected shadow. And the idea is that these are very highly reflective metallic surfaces and Something nearby, whether it's a building, a monster, whatever, is casting a shadow that these would be reflecting back to the viewer. 
and we don't really care what it is. In comic books, it's really common for metals to just have these sort of, you know, ambiguous, anomalous black shapes that are just kind of bounced off them. And it's the idea that that's scene dressing reflected in a really scattered light sort of situation. Now I'm going to take a little Citadel Contrast Basilicanum Gray and just use this as a wash over the cracked pavement on the bottom of the base. I'm really not going to do more with the base besides that because it's really not the start of the show. It's just broken rubble pavement and it doesn't need to be more than that. So really what I want is I want the big glowing crystal to be the scene stealer, right? And the pavement is just there to hold it up. All right, there's my completed Harbinger Comet for the Planet Eaters of Monster Apocalypse. And I gotta say, I really enjoyed this piece because I've never really had the opportunity or the need to paint a bright red-orange crystal before. So this really was just a lot of kind of making things up as I went, and it all turned out for the best, and I'm really happy about that. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, do something epic. Hey, thanks for watching my video. If you enjoyed that one, please hit like and subscribe and don't forget to hit the bell so you get notifications when I post new videos in the future. If you want to take your support even further, you can do that at patreon.com slash epic duck. Every little bit helps keep the lights on and the paint flowing, puts new models on the table so I can make interesting videos, and most importantly, puts a roof over my family's head and food on the table. You can also join me for live painting shows several times a week at twitch.tv slash epic duck studios. I'd love if you came by and watch the show sometime and follow the channel. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who's supported my content over the years, both past and present. It's been an absolutely wild ride, and I couldn't do this without all the wonderful fans and flockers out there. The hobby community is just an amazing group of people, and you really make this worth doing. So let's just keep on doing this together, making more content, and just being fantastic together for years to come. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, do something epic.